Now the main identity is the usual one, is that the trace of the log of a matrix is log of the determinant of a matrix. And now if you write this out and take exponent on both sides, you find that determinant of 1 minus our evolution operator and because you people just like didn't like the z, didn't like generating functions I tried to explain that you can interpret the z as some kind of probability so if you watch my video I hope I'll convince you why it says that that is e to the trace of a logarithm of 1 minus z lambda. Now, z is now a very useful handle. The operator itself, if you really care about such thing, can be bounded in some way. So, if z is sufficiently small, this makes sense. This can be expanded as a Taylor series in z. So then we use a famous identity that says logarithm is minus sum k equals r n equals 1 to infinity. Instead of factorial for logarithm, we have 1 over n here. And then you get this thing to the nth power. And this is a matrix model, it's an operator, so you get a trace of the logarithm of the matrix. But this object we computed, so it's here. We have that object. <coughs> so we know that the way we want to write this object is we want to write it as e to the minus n equals 1 and then we have this thing that we can write this as I'm doing this for discrete time first but the continuous time is very similar all p each one of them had np periodic points and then all repeats r equals 1 to infinity. So I'm just rewriting this n in the form uh, trace of L computed on periodic orbit. So because they're isolated, I can do this locally to the you know NP times R. But this only contributes C n p times r if n equals n p times r. So only terms in this sum, so this is just this thing rewritten. Only terms in that sum that contribute are the ones in which n is factored in a small, shorter prime cycle and it's repeat. So that's just identity. We did this number of times. But we have this sum over n's which gets rid of the delta function. So this becomes e to the minus sum over p and p. And then uh, divided, divided by n. Okay, so uh, there was an n here. So NP divided by N equals, because of this Kronecker delta function, NP divided by N is NP divided by NP times R, because we only allow the repeats of a shorter cycle, so this cancels. So we get, instead of N, we get 1 over R. R goes from 1 to infinity. 
And this thing we computed. So this thing is called determinant 1 minus, you know, we picked up a Jacobian here of the prime orbit. If we do it in a map, we just get this. Uh, if we don't do it in a map, we get the other thing. But the form is the same, repeating. <coughs> then it's e to the minus well, to the our little parameter that we'll use to manipulate series because we will have to take derivatives of our eigenvalues with respect to this parameter minus s t p so this is computed on periodic orbits and for repeat it's repeated our times and that's it and what is a determinant so the determinant is one minus well it's just product of the eigenvalue right? now you know on this thing you can rightly object I think you should object because this is a determinant of an operator on infinite space so we really have to think about how it's defined and it's actually defined exactly in this way so determinants of operators on infinite dimensional space the so-called trace class are defined in terms of traces. So if these things are convergent, then the left hand is convergent. Now for some reason, you know, my colleagues in literature claim that this is a clever resummation. I never understood why determinant <laughs> is meant to be a clever resummation. Uh, that's what it is. You know, determinant is expressed in terms of traces, and we have expression for traces. And uh, at this point, everything I'm saying is okay for you for finite matrices. If you seriously, you know, follow the counting chapter, or our discussion there, all these manipulations were legitimate. Now, where they're legitimate for infinite dimensional spaces is a non-trivial thing. So one has to prove that these formulas make sense in this very general context of uh, applying them, let's say, to fluid dynamics or cardiac dynamics or God knows what. And uh, the mathematical status is that we can prove this for some idealized flows, which are non-trivial, you know what I mean? In working with these formulas, we get very good intuition where are the pitfalls, where the things could be wrong, etc. So I'm, in a kind of, in a Maoist way, I, I'm uh, emboldened by the practice uh, that these things work. And then I had a graduate student that I went swimming with in Copenhagen in a sit the swimming pool every so often and then he declared that one of the swims he doesn't understand this thing that doesn't make any sense so he wrote his own thesis <coughs> in which he proved that this makes sense uh, in certain cases and he proved that the literature <coughs> previously to him Ruel etc they were wrong they, they made some errors and now he's a professor of mathematics in France so you know pieces of this have been worked out, but we will use this from now on, and that will be the point of the next lecture.